So, so basically, uh, yeah, I work for AWS, and uh, but uh, since this is like a multi-cloud event, I'm going to try and, and make this as not really cloud agnostic, but many of the things I'm going to be presenting. I, I'm going to have a lot of code, by the way, and I'm sorry, but it's Java code. Yeah, I know it's Java, but <laughs> it, it's, it hurts me more than you. But uh, m most of the, the, all the code I'm going to present uh, you could execute anywhere, in a Raspberry Pi, on your laptop, at any other cloud provider, on your servers, anywhere. And then I will be presenting some of the managed tools we have, but all the code examples, it will be, they will work exactly the same in any other place. And actually the turn of streaming that I'm going to be presenting, it's also the same in any other cloud provider. So, you know, even if I'm going to speak in about some of our solutions, hopefully it will be good for everybody else. Uh, that's my Twitter, which is uh, interesting in case you have any questions or anything. Uh, you can, I'm going to stick around today, so you can ask me directly. But if I don't know something, or if you have any questions like uh, any other point, just send me a tweet, uh, private or public, as you prefer. And if I don't know the answer, uh, I know the person who knows the answer, so I can do that. And the other thing, uh, if you are already using AWS, and you have any feedback about the products I'm going to be speaking about today, it's super cool if you can tell me, because then I can pass the feedback to the service team. And uh, because if we build a, a cloud and the users don't like it, what's the point? So eventually, if we tell them a few times the same thing, they finally they listen. So that's kind of the idea. Okay. So I'm going to be speaking about real-time streaming analytics. And the first thing is, why, why do I want to speak specifically about real-time? Is that different from doing batch analytics? I, I've been working with data for quite a few years now. And at the beginning, I was doing only batch. And then when I started doing a streaming, I thought it would be very similar. And it is in a way, but then many things are different. So before I start, how many of you um, consider yourself data engineers? Or at least are working with some kind of data pipeline? OK, a few of you, a few of you, not even half. That's good. And um, doing open source, maybe? I mean, working on with open source tools, or yeah? Cool. Which ones? Which tools do you use for this kind of thing, for streaming? Or? Spark. Spark. Spark is a good one. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Kafka and Fling, yeah, yeah. You totally, uh, you might be better off in a different room, because you already know most of the things I'm going to be talking about. But yeah, yeah. At some point, I might ask you if I have any questions. Any, any, any other tools? Cool. For those, so that, those are super cool. Anyone using any other cloud provider? That's OK. I mean, I've been working for AWS only for one year. Before that, I used to do a lot of things for Google. So you know, that, that's OK if you use uh, other cloud providers. The real, real difference is like from not having a cloud to having a cloud. So that, that's kind of the idea, just to understand the audience. So, so uh, I'm going to do an intro, because you know most of you are not too familiar with this. So the thing is, imagine I tell you, OK, I want to calculate the total and the average of several numbers, and it's like, Man, I don't know, that's pretty simple. Yeah, I know, I know. But maybe, what if there are like too many numbers? They don't fit on a single server, on a single drive, on a single machine. That's more interesting. But you know, you have Hadoop and these things, and that's just a problem of distributed data, which is cute, but you know, we are already in the 21st century. We are over this. OK, but the data set is not a static. Because if I tell you calculate the average of, or, or calculate anything on a large data set, and you know beforehand the size, you can dimension. I'm going to need this many servers. Of, of course, the, the, the calculations will be wrong, but I'm going to need this many servers. I, I can distribute this way. I can do this. I can do that. But in a data set that is always moving, how you do that calculation? It's much harder. It actually can happen that uh, you give me the average, and then we get some new numbers, and of course, this is changing. And since the data set is going to be moving, very likely on a streaming, you have data coming from, from Internet of Things, some from sensors, or from, from mobile applications. And those are going to be in different parts of the world. So they are going to be coming from different places. And we get interesting things when you have people in different places. It's like we are at different distance from the data centers. So maybe imagine you have two users playing a game, or two users trying to buy something. And uh, they do the same action with milliseconds, or maybe even seconds of difference. But one is closer to the data center than the other. It might be the case you receive the events in the wrong order. And for many use cases, you don't care. But if you care, that's a problem. 
and that's a, a hard problem to solve. So those kind of things, you know, are inter when you have the static data set from the beginning, you never have these issues. You always have like the complete data set, oh, that's easy. But when the data set is changing, like, you know, these kind of problems are going to happen. Or you might be having, okay, we have different sensors, or we have users on the mobile applications, so maybe someone is playing your game, and then they enter the underground or a plane, and they keep playing, but they cannot send the events. And afterwards, two hours later, they send you a bunch of old events. Oh, but I already told you the totals. Oh, yeah, but now I know they are wrong. What can I do? Should I just set up? Set up? It's like, okay, no one will realize. Maybe I should do something about that. H how you work about those things? So those turns actually are, are quite interesting, quite fun. But uh, if you try to solve yourself those turns by doing your own solution, it's actually very hard to do. But that's kind of the thing we are talking about. And of course, since we are talking about the streaming, very likely the stream is not going to be always the same. At some point, you'll have like you know, a lot of people using the service. At some point, no one will be using the service. How can you work with those kind of things and to keep low latency? Because again, for batch, if I want to get a result tomorrow, I don't care if, I, if auto scaling takes me one hour or 10 minutes. It's like, yeah, this is bad, but not too bad. But on real time, I really need to be able to, on real time, respond to the demand. And that's actually quite interesting. And of course, in real life, no one is going to ask you, give me the average of some numbers. They are going to tell you the average per device, per team, per user, per hour, per whatever. So you are going to, to keep track of many different things at the same time. And this starts to look already like a real life scenario, but not really. Because in real life, you need to have monitoring. You need to be sure that if something goes down, you need to, you know, it needs to self heal, hopefully. You need to make sure that uh, that you know if there is uh, if there is something that is not looking right, you are going to receive an alert, and of course your boss is not going to give you a lot of resources for this. It's like I don't know, do what you can with what you have. That's kind of the idea. So that's the term of streaming. That's what I'm going to be talking about. How we use systems that help me do these kind of things. But this look a bit abstract. So let's let's. Let's do uh, something a bit better. So as we saw, this is going to be hard to set up. It's going to be difficult to scale. It's going to be difficult to get high availability, blah, 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 blah. And of course, if you use a cloud solution, it's going to be a bit easier. But let's play a game. Um, we, we are not going to play anything, but let's play a game. So imagine your manager, your boss, whoever tells you, your customer, uh, I want you to build an application, which is, uh, I want you to build the analytics for you know something like Cabify or Uber or my taxi. So we are going to have taxi cabs moving around, maybe in different places. And I want you, you uh, to just uh, you know to, to design the analytic solution to in real time to be able to make this happen. So I want to have it's something very easy. I only want to have how many total trips and, and what's the average for that we are charging. So something very easy. Average and total number of trips. Sounds easy enough, yeah? Just an average and a total number. For moving cars at maybe not Uber scale, I mean, it could be Uber scale, but let's, you know, maybe my taxi scale or something like that. Okay, so imagine someone tells you this. How much code, how much effort do you think it will take on your side to build something like this? If, if they ask you, Maybe with the first thing like, this is fine. So you, you, you can use a number of techniques. One is the technique of, you know, staying like very quiet. So hopefully they are going to ask to the next person. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know. So yeah, the other thing is like saying whatever, knowing your boss, she will forget about that. And you know, you can go with your life. But that's kind of the thing. So, so if, they, if they ask you, that, that happens. Can you do this? Yes, yeah, or if you say no, they are always right. If you say yes, they forget about that. It was just you know, something they wanted. But anyway, imagine you had to do this for real, and you had to do this. How, how much code do you think it takes to make something like this with a streaming solutions? The people using Spark or Flink might already know about this, so don't take a guess. <laughs> but the, the, the people that are not used to work with streaming solutions, this sounds like a hard problem, yeah? It's actually not that hard if you use the right tools. You can actually do this in about 200 lines of Java code. And of course, you know, you cannot do anything at all in, in, in 20 lines of Java code. 20 lines of Java code, you cannot do anything at all. But, but you have like, you know, maybe 200 lines or, or 2,000 lines of 
declarations, exceptions, castings, whatever, import interfaces, and 20 lines doing something. But, that, that, but, that's the thing. but those 20 lines are super cool. Th those are the 20 lines that you know, pay your salary. So no, no, that's, that's, that, that's the way it is. The rest is the, is the, the ID intelligence auto-completing. But 20 lines you have to copy and paste from Stack Overflow. So <laughs> Coding is so, you know, everything is already done, so you don't, you don't really have to. I mean, either you, can, you copy from Stack Overflow and you are right, or you copy from the documentation on, on AWS and then you change all the permissions because it's everything like, you know, with their own permissions, but that's okay. So, so basically, you can do that with 10 lines of Java or with uh, just, I will tell you later, even with some SQL, you don't need to do any Java code at all. That's what we're going to be talking about. And uh, I told you before, but Javier, you, you told me you wanted like a real life solution. Not only the business logic, also monitoring, auto scaling, blah, 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 blah. And that's true. Because the cool thing is, if you try to do this on your own, using open source, you can do it. And you will have to write that Java code, but then you have to operate everything in production. The cool thing about using a cloud is that you can delegate on the cloud provider, in this case AWS, to manage all the things that are quite hard, but actually they are always the same. Things like, oh, suddenly I have much, much more events coming now. Yeah, I need to have a bigger pipeline. That's okay, but that's exactly the same for you and for any other person doing a streaming. Oh, a server is going down. That's okay, we'll replace it. But that's exactly the same for you and for any other customer doing a streaming. You, you, you see what I'm there? Yeah? Oh, we have something is looking like, you know, we are getting to the limit. We have to send an alert. Okay, but that's exactly the same for you and for any other people. So the, the, the idea here is like if you use cloud, you can delegate the things that are quite hard to achieve at a scale, but that is exactly the same for everybody doing a streaming. And you can focus on the 20 lines of code that you have to write for your business. You get the idea? And of course, 20 is an oversimplification. That's a lie. It will be like, you know, but, but you see, where I'm going, yeah? You can focus actually on that part and forget about everything else. If you try to do everything on your own, on-premises, then you have to worry about the business logic and about having the whole infrastructure, and that's going to be much, much, much harder. Cool? So uh, if you try to do this with open source, uh, you can do it, and it's super cool, and actually I'm going to be doing this with open source uh, today. So if you try to do this with open source, there are some tools you can use, and actually some people will already mention that. Some people were saying Kafka, yeah, Kafka is super cool. Kafka allows you to ingest messages from different places and just stream them to other places, which is super cool. Uh, Apache Flink or Spark. Spark and Flink are the same thing. So Flink is a Spark for hipsters, kind of the idea. But yeah, that's, no, that's, that's, that's it. But uh, Spark is, is super cool. Spark was like the first open source solution that allow us to do uh, in a simple way, simple, but you know, in a simple way, you could do batch and streaming analytics, uh, you know, without being a huge company. So everybody could do a Spark. So the first time I, I used a Spark, at the beginning was a bit weird, like, you know, to understand how it worked. But once you, once you get around that, it's actually super powerful. And Flink is the same idea from a Spark, just a bit better for operations. And actually, many of the ideas from Flink have been passed back, passed back to a Spark. Many of the ideas from a Spark have been passed back to Flink. So the difference between one and the other it's not really, really, really that much. It's just Flink is a bit better, I would say, for operational uh, issues like auto scaling or keeping uh, backups of your pipeline. For all those things, Flink is better designed. To be fair, Flink was designed later, so they already knew the things that were missing. And Flink was started by uh, as open source in, in Germany, it's still open source, and it was acquired recently by Alibaba. So it works at a scale, and you can do very interesting things with Flink. All the code samples I will do today will be around Flink, also with Kafka. And Elasticsearch, uh, if you've been around, you totally know Elasticsearch is something no one uses for search. Elasticsearch is used mostly for uh, DevOps, for metrics, for analytics, because it has something called Kibana, which is super cool for doing, uh, you know, for doing visualization. So some people still use Elasticsearch for search, but we are going to be using Elasticsearch actually for doing representation of, of graphs, of, of big data, which is super cool. So that's, a, that's kind of the thing. Uh, before we start, for those of you that you have never seen uh, uh, how this looks like in code, I'm going to show you a little bit of Java. So we see, okay. So we see how it is to do uh, a pipeline with these tools. The concept of, of a streaming is very simple. In any tool you use, a, a Spark or Flink or Sansa or, or 
I don't know, data flow, absolutely anything you, you use, they have the same abstractions. You have some kind of input, and usually it's called the source. We have some kind of output, usually it's called the sinks. You can have as many inputs as you want, as many outputs as you want, and in between, you can do any transformations. And transformations are like something very weird, but if you think about SQL, you are doing those things all the time. Things like doing a join between two different, when, when in SQL you talk about tables, in streaming we talk about the streams. So when you do a join between two tables, in streaming you could do a join between two streams. As long as you have some column that allows you to match the, the two streams, you can do a join. You can do a join, you can do a maximum, and a minimum, and a group by, a filter, all those things you can do in SQL is what you can do with these tools. But instead of SQL, you use Java code or Python sometimes. That's kind of the thing. But the idea is exactly the same. You have inputs, which will be tables. Outputs will be other tables. I mean, it's not, but the, the abstraction is the same. And then any transformations, goodbye, joins, filter, maximum, minimum, you get the idea, yeah? And you can do this as complex as you want. So let's go to the code. I have the simplest pipeline ever with Flink, which is this. This is actually for batch. With, with Flink, I can do also batch and streaming. So the simplest pipeline ever is this. I define the environment, which is just create the, you know, the, the context for execution, mm -hmm. and then I create the source. I'm going to have a source, which is going to be uh, strings. This source, I'm going to be getting it reading from a text file. I could connect to any other thing, but I'm going to be reading from a text file, and I'm going to be writing to the destination, which is going to be a different text file. I'm not doing anything. Reading from one place, writing in the other. Super simple, yeah? So if I execute this, what this will do, it will be it will be reading a file, which I have here, and it will be writing another file, right? Let me see if that's true. I'm going to try and execute this. Are you executing? Maybe not, yes. It's executing, and this is my input file, which is super small, just three lines. So I'm reading a file, I'm writing into another. So you will expect I will have a file called output.txt with these three lines, yeah? Is that what you will expect, everyone? No? No? Yes? No? You already see that it's not happening. Why you can see that? OK, maybe it put that inside a directory. But uh, why, 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 that's the question. Why is that happening? Why is it not a single file? That's the good thing. If I go to the output, I can see I don't have one file. I have actually four files. Four files, three lines. What's happening here? It's like, is this broken? Is Javier stupid? Yeah, one of, one of the two is true. But so two of the files are actually empty. Uh, one has two lines. The other has one line. What happened here? I have CPUs, four CPUs on this laptop. Flink, without me doing anything, is going to say, how many CPUs have in this cluster? If it's a cluster, you might have 2,000 CPUs. <coughs> I don't care. As a developer, I say, this is my input, this is my output, this is my transformation, two things. That's the beauty of Spark or of Flink. They parallelize automatically. So for a developer, it's super easy to do things at the scale. I don't this with a file with, you know, three lines. If I do this with 2,000 files of, of 20, I don't know, 20 terabytes in total, that's fine. I don't have to worry about that. <coughs> it will happen. On my laptop, it will take forever. The laptop will, you know. But on a cluster, it will happen. And the code is exactly the same. You see the idea? So you don't have to worry about those things. The tools, the open source tools, are super cool for this kind of thing. So that's the, you know, the easiest pipeline I can think of for, uh, you know, for batch. We are going to do one actually for a streaming. I told you that there's something called Kafka, and Kafka, you totally know, is a message queue. So I have here a few windows. This is Kafka running. So Kafka has, he, this, the first window is like nothing. It's just a zookeeper, which is a dependency for Kafka. The second window is Kafka running here. That's OK. I have, in Kafka, you create topics, which is how you send messages, like communication channels. So if I do this. Uh, let me see what I am. So you can see here that I have in my Kafka three topics created. One called Flink input, one, one called Flink output. Okay? So this is just my, my setup with Kafka. In Kafka, I have a command line tool 
that allows me to send data to any topic. And I have a command line tool that allows me to consume data from any topic. So I'm just uh, connecting, let me just remove this. So I'm just connecting uh, in the top window here is just anything I write, it will be sent to one topic. In the second window here, anything I write, it will be read from a different topic. If I put something on top, nothing is happening because they are different topics. But I'm going to create now a pipeline with Kafka in which we are going to do the same thing we did with files, but with streams. We are going to be reading from one topic and writing into the other, and this will be already streaming. So this is what it looked like. The first thing you do, you create the environment exactly as before. Second thing, creating the input is a bit more difficult because instead of uh, reading from a text file, you need to connect to Kafka. So in the same way that you when, when, connect, when you connect to a database, you have to specify the host and the port. Here we are saying the same thing. We are saying, hey, I want to connect to localhost, and I'm going to be using, I'm going to be reading from the topic fling input, which uh, is made of strings. Okay. Same thing for the output. I'm going to be uh, using a producer, which is uh, is going to be living in this uh, host, in localhost. It's going to be this topic. It's going to be strings. Once I have the definition of the input and the output, the pipeline is exactly the same. So all I do is like, I connect to the streaming source, automatically will be getting messages. And for each message, I'm just writing to the destination. If I execute this, oops, wrong, oh no. <laughs> ah, it looks white, okay, cool, hipster. So I don't know what I did with the key combinations, but super weird. Anyway, that's executing now. So I'm starting the pipeline. So this already started. Now, if I go back here, every time I write something, uh, I cannot type, but that's okay. It says here, in real time. So it's super stupid. But now I have here a streaming pipeline, which is reading data from one Kafka, writing into the other. And it's like, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, it's a bit boring. It's just writing and reading. You want to do some aggregations. I told you before, you can do things like group buys and so on. So if you wanted to do that, and, and then we'll, we'll go back to the slides, but just for you. So if I wanted to do that, then let me just see here. I have another example in which we are doing basically the same thing, but we are doing the Hello World of streaming. We are going to take each word in the line, and we are going to be counting the words. And the pipeline is very similar. We start defining the input, the output, and in between, I'm doing this. I'm doing, for each line, I'm going to be calling a, a Java function. This function I have defined below is a stupid function to split uh, lines into words. It's Java, it takes this code. Uh, you can do it a bit better, but basically it splits, you know, you can, you can call any function here. You need to have like some, you know, you, you need to be careful, the function shouldn't have side effects and so on, but basically you can create your own operators. So I'm here calling for each line, separate into words, uh, group by the word itself, by the first column, and then keep adding one every time there is a, you know, a hit for that word. So if I execute this pipeline, I'm going to be having now I say here again Dobre is telling me, oh, Jen one time, Dobre another time, Dobre Vietchur, I don't know how you write this, but basically something like that. It says, Dobre is to I, Vietchur is one, you see? So that's, that's it. So now it's counting words. You can do hello world, hello whatever, and, and that's about it. So this is a stream pipeline, and you know, it will scale as much as you want. you to see what this looks like in code and how you implement it. So the, and that's totally open source, that's you know, something that Flink is doing for you without you having to do anything at all. Are you still with me here? Yeah? Cool. So now, if you didn't know about the streaming, you probably are thinking, this is much easier than the data engineer streaming company you know, said that they made this look like very complex. It's actually very simple. Once you know what you are doing, doing a streaming is, is, is not much. Uh, different to do SQL just with Java. <coughs> the, the challenge with these tools is that they work every 
this is like something that happens in any big data platform. They work very well in one server. The moment you have more than one server, oh, that's the fun. So if you have tried to manage Elasticsearch or Kafka on a multi-server environment, you know what I'm talking about. And if not, look at the people with pain now in their faces. Oh yeah, this is, but really it's hard. Trying to scale those things, you know, on your own is hard. And these tools are prepared for that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Kafka, Elasticsearch, Flink, they are prepared to be run on a distributed environment. But you need to have several masters, several workers, take care of space, take care of monitoring, take care of coordination, which again is hard stuff. If you want to do that on your own, be my guest, do it. But uh, something you can do is just use some of the tools that we are using. And of course, if you use uh, Amazon, you are not alone. We have a lot of customers using these tools every day for doing interesting things, including Amazon.com. And before I continue, uh, I want to be speaking about some things that are based in open source. And we are Amazon. Amazon and open source, I don't know. Ah, sorry. So Amazon open source, I don't know. You, you, you have heard that, yeah? Amazon open source, also me. When I started working for Amazon about 10 months ago, actually on my interview, it was one of the questions I was doing to, to the Amazonians. It's like, hey, Amazon and open source, I don't know, because I really like open source, really. I've been around the ecosystem. And they were telling me, no, no, really, it's, uh, we are cool, we are getting better. It's like, it's not that we are too bad, it's that we, we have bad marketing. And it's true, if you, if you actually, if you check the top contributors to open source, Amazon is actually the sixth company with most contributions to open source. I mean, we are, I, I believe the ranking is something like Microsoft, Google, Red Hat, IBM, Intel, and Amazon. So there is not much space to move there, you know? Those companies are like, but that's the thing, we are the sixth contributor like worldwide to open source, which is not too bad. We have more than 2,000 projects open source on GitHub. And we contribute to projects like, uh, like Spark, auto-scaling on Spark, the, the auto-scaling capacity of Spark in open source was contributed by Amazon because we're using it internally and we need it. So, it's, and same thing, Redis, for example, encryption for Redis, we contribute it uh, be, between nodes because we need it. And now actually there is a new version of encryption that was announced a month ago by the people from Redis that is based on the one we contribute open source. So that's kind of the thing, we contribute to Linux, we contribute to a lot of different things. So I understand that when you hear about Amazon open source, you might be a skeptical, but actually we are, we are working very much on, on changing that. And uh, yeah, you can, you can check more over there and you have some information. And actually we are committed to contribute to Kafka and Elastic. It's not that we are using it and we are an evil corporation and we, you know, we, we take advantage of all the poor developers that are contributing to open source, which actually, by the way, most individual developers don't contribute much. It's, it's largely companies. But yeah, we are actually doing our thing here, just in case, because you know, I get this all the time. And I think it's important to make sure when we talk about open source to, to be very clear about what we do. Cool, only 15 minutes. This is going to be fun. So uh, if you want to use native tools, not only open source, you can use the Kinesis family of products. Kinesis is uh, the streaming platform on AWS, and we have four different products. And I'm going to be focusing only on two. Video streams, I'm not going to be talking about. Video streams is for a specific use case, and I'm not going to be talking about that. The Firehose is a very simple project. I'll tell you about that. I'm going to be speaking about data streams, which is similar to Kafka, and about data analytics, which is similar to Flink. So I'm going to be presenting those two, mostly. And Kinesis is uh, actually production ready. If you're using AWS and you are paying for the service, the amount of money you are paying is decided by Kinesis. We're using Kinesis to monitor the usage of the services. If you're using AWS and you're using anything serverless, any kind of notification, that, those are delivered by Kinesis. So again, if you're using AWS and you're using any kind of monitoring with CloudWatch, that's Kinesis. So Kinesis is powering you know, much of AWS, also is used at a scale at Amazon.com. So we really are using Kinesis for many interesting things. I'll tell you later how Netflix are, are using Kinesis too. Uh, so the Firehose is a very simple uh, part of Kinesis. This comes to solve the trolling of, I have streaming data, but I don't want to do analytics in real time. So I have data moving fast, but I will analyze it later. Maybe I want to build a data lake. And that's the Firehose. So in the Firehose, you configure an input of data, you configure an output, and the output can be only one of these outputs. You configure the input, the output. Optionally, you can transform each event with a serverless lambda function. 
in between. That's about it. And you cannot do much more. And with Kinesis, you don't really have real time because you can output data. The fastest you can do is one per minute. So one per minute will output all the data that came you know, in the last minute. You can actually go on one per minute or uh, until one per week. So you decide how often you want to output, but you cannot do anything like real time. It's for the use case of getting fast data, storing somewhere else. It's very boring. Most people on Stack Overflow don't complain about the file host because there is nothing to complain about. You put data, data gets out, fully serverless. You cannot configure anything. You can, you can only configure a few things about you know, the names and so on, but there is nothing to, to fine tune. So very simple stuff, very boring stuff. It works. Data streams is a bit better. Data streams is for real time. What do I mean by real time? If 100 milliseconds is real time for you, then this is real time. If 100 milliseconds is slow for you, then this is not real time. So that's kind of the, because you know, that's the thing. I mean, some people do like high frequency trading. If I not, if I don't have something in 10 microseconds, I'm losing millions. That's okay. That's, that's not for you. But if 100 milliseconds latency since the event entered the pipeline until you can process is good enough for you, then this is real time. And data streams is very flexible because it allows you to do, instead of having just one input and one output, you can have multiple people sending to the same data stream, multiple consumers reading from the same data stream. It allows you to do uh, a bit more interesting things. So it's real time and you can actually do absolutely anything. You can have multiple consumers, multiple producers, and do uh, real life streaming in that, which is uh, much better. It's actually quite cool, and, and Kafka can do also the same thing, in that it allows you to replay the stream. You can, when you start reading, you can read from, the, from now, or you can start reading from one day ago, two hours ago, 10 seconds ago, so you can replay. For things like you know, making sure something is highly available, it's super interesting because if one worker goes down, you can start again and replay the stream since the last checkpoint that you knew it was actually processed. So you can go back and forth and do interesting things with this. You get the idea? You can do this with Kafka, and actually a lot of people use Kafka only for that use case because it allows you to go back in history. Actually, in data streams, it's a bit limited. It allows you to go back only up to one week in the history. You cannot replay the whole history of the stream, only one week. Okay, so it's different in, to Kafka in that regard, but that's the idea. So when you code in the, when you are working with the stream, you can choose, if by default you start reading from now on, but you can choose where you want to start reading. You can choose at one point in time or at one sequence number when you want to be reading the data. And another thing about data streams is that it's not, it's serverless, kind of, but it's not serverless kind of. So depending, yeah. So you don't really have to, you cannot connect to any server. You cannot do SSH or anything like that. And you don't have to configure any servers, but you have to configure the capacity. In, in Kinesis, you, in data streams, you need to define how many shards you are going to be uh, using. A shard means, uh, in a shard you can send up to 1,000 messages uh, per second. Actually, you can send more if you put them like, you know, if you, if you put them together. But you can send up to 1,000 messages per second or up to uh, one megabit of ingestion per second. If you, if you have, megabytes, sorry. If you have more data than this, then you need to add more shards. And it doesn't auto scale. So if you want to scale this, you need to do it on your own. It's very simple to do, actually. You can monitor and scale. And we provide an open source library that does exactly that. There is an open source library, which is called uh, Kinesis Java Auto Scaling Util, something like that on GitHub. You put that work in, it monitors your stream, and it adds or removes automatically capacity. So it can be done, but it's, it's not auto scaling. You have to do it on your own. But it works, and you know, it works at uh, pretty much at anything you want to do. So I'm going to show you a quick demo of the one I, I showed you with Kafka. I'm going to do exactly the same with Kinesis. So you see how hard it is to replace Kafka by Kinesis in your code. So let me just for a second and then I'll tell you a bit more about this. Where are you? Here you are. Okay, so this is why this is so wrong. <sighs> yeah, it's like, it looks like worse to me, I don't know. So, yeah. So the Kafka library, the Kafka code, it had the definition of the source, and it, 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 we had to define to which host and which topic it will connect. So in Kinesis, we define to which region on AWS 
and to which string we connect. Then for the output, we do the same thing. The code from this point on is exactly the same. The cool thing about Flink, it abstracts all the sinks and all the sources. So as long as they have the same semantics, if, both, if a source is batch and the other is batch, you can replace them. If a source is a streaming and the other is a streaming, you can replace them. So basically, the code is exactly the same. You only change the definition for the input and the output. So it's very easy to move back and forth from not only open source to other open source, but from Google Cloud Pubs up to uh, Apache Kafka to AWS uh, Kinesis data streams. You just change the definition of the source and it works automatically. So Flink is super interesting for that. So the code is exactly the same. Just for you to see that I'm not lying to you and it's not just code that you know it doesn't do anything. We can execute this. It's now executing. So I told you before, in Kafka, you have like really nice uh, command line tools for working with uh, you know inputs and outputs on Kinesis data streams. Let's see, you have tools. They are not that nice, but they are tools, okay? So basically, on Kinesis data streams, I told you before, the first thing you need to do is define the, the point in time in which you are going to start reading. That's called an iterator. And uh, I'm going to, first I'm going to do so here, what I'm doing with this, all this code is basically I'm going to be calling to the, I'm going to create an iterator. So I'm going to define the point in time I'm going to read for a particular string for this millisecond onwards. So now if I use this iterator to get data, I should be getting data if I send in data here. And now if I go here to, uh, that's not the one I wanted. Just bear with me here. Kinesis. Okay, so here I have the command line for putting data into Kinesis. So I'm going to put data saying, hello, Amazon Web Services, which is very boring, but actually I'm going to say, chest Amazon Web Services. Cool. And it's been sending the data, and now here I'm going to be reading that data. So I'm going to be saying something like, uh, get records. And this is going to tell me, hopefully, yep. where are you? Oh yeah, it took a little bit, but it's telling me, okay, there is here some record. And it looks very weird because this comes in base 64. So if I do something like this, and I decode base 64, decode this, it will tell me chest is one time, which is what we were after, yep. Of course, I can do this like, you know, a few more times, and I can do like anything I want. And I have a command line, which is a slightly more complex, but it's the same idea, really. So what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to read the whole thing in one go. And it's telling me, okay, so from Kinesis data streams, uh, Amazon was one, services was one, uh, chess was three, you, you get the idea, yeah? So that's kind of the thing. That's what we are doing here. We are just reading, getting the data, and uh, getting the, the running count. And I didn't have to change anything on the pipeline, only the definition of the input and the output. Yep, still clear with this? Cool. Let's move fast, fast forward to the last part. I know, I know, five minutes left. It will be six or seven, but hopefully it will be okay. <coughs> so, uh, does it escape? It escapes. Netflix, uh, um, I told you Amazon is using it, but if you use it, it's like, but maybe you're using something special. Maybe you are using like, we don't have any internal version of Kinesis. We have exactly the same as everybody else. So Netflix actually, they were using for their log monitoring different tools. I, I believe they just changed to another stack by the way recently, but this was true a few months ago. So they were using a different stack and they were having problems auto scaling because you know, auto scaling in things like Kafka is, is not really designed for that. And data streams is not designed for auto scaling directly, but as I told you, it's very easy to adjust. And that was the main reason why they were doing this. They are streaming, they use a thousand starts, which means about a million events per second and trolley their packaging, so more than a million events per second for Netflix. And for them, the selling point was they could auto scale and they could have analytic results in seconds from the logs, so they could monitor the infrastructure. So it scales, you know, it, it works pretty well at a Netflix scale. In real life, you are going to have totally a combination of data streams and the Firehose because some things you want to do in real time, some things you want to do in batch. So for real life, you're totally going to have a combination of one or the other. Cool. 
But I still didn't talk about analytics. I've been just speaking about, you know, sending data. Well, I, I saw analytics on, on open source, but not on AWS. What if you want to do analytics and you don't want to manage the servers? Because right now, I'm still running the pipeline locally on my laptop. I'm connecting to data streams, but the pipeline is running here. So I'm limited to four CPUs and my laptop, which is really, I mean, it's a MacBook, but it's not really that good. I, I, I'm actually a Linux person, but they made me use this. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, it's the, the part I don't like about my job is using the Mac. But the idea is, OK, so data analytics, uh, we have a, a solution for this. We offer Kinesis Data Analytics, which is basically manage Flink, no more and no less. So it's Apache Flink in a version slightly older than the latest version because, you know, they release a new version, we have to adapt. So it's like a slightly behind the times version of Apache Flink, uh, but fully managed. But anything you can do on Flink, you can do here. So you create the pipeline and you can deploy directly on um, Kinesis Data Analytics, which is interesting. So we allow you to do absolutely everything we, uh, I show you. There are things I didn't tell you, things that are difficult on streaming. For example, uh, the guarantee of delivering a message exactly once. On a streaming, it might happen sometimes you get the same message twice if there is an error. It might happen that sometimes you get a message and it gets lost. With, with Flink, you can actually uh, achieve exactly one delivery of messages that sometimes is important. So you can do that directly with Flink, and of course you can do it with, uh, with uh, data analytics. And the way you do it, you create the application exactly as we did. You create the, the jar file as you will create any other jar file. And then you put the jar file on S3 and you tell Kinesis Data Analytics, I want to execute this pipeline. That's it. You don't have to do anything else. You put it there and we execute and we auto scale. By default, we auto scale data analytics. If you don't want to auto scale, you can actually say, no, I want to run only with this amount of, of servers and that's okay. But by default, we are going to auto scale and you set only the maximum and we take care about everything else. I already saw you in code, but the structure is you have more one or more uh, streams uh, for the input, one or more syncs, and you have filters that can be pretty much anything you want. There are a lot of built-in filters, but you can actually build your own filters if you want and build your own transformations. So this open source is very well connected with any other tool in the ecosystem, not only with AWS. So you're using RabbitMQ or Kafka or Redis or uh, any database with JDBC or Cassandra or uh, absolutely anything. Since Flink is becoming the facto standard for streaming, all the, uh, all, all the developers that have any tool that can be used with streaming, they make sure they have a connector for Flink because otherwise people are not going to be using them. So Flink is, it, it, you know, it connects very well with the ecosystem, not only with our tools. Another cool thing about Flink is that it keeps automatic snapshots uh, of your application, which means at any point in time, it can snapshot what's happening internally. Not only what's happening internally on the application, but also on the pipeline. So it means you can say at, at any point, at this particular moment, take a snapshot of the internal state of the pipeline. And you might have data which is in flight, and you are aggregating, and maybe you are doing aggregations, I want to output data every five seconds, and you are doing this in the second three. So some data is still in flight. You can do the backup at that point in time, you can move the backup to another machine, restart, and the pipelines will restart from that moment on. So it's super powerful because with this you can actually do, uh, you can upgrade a pipeline to a new version. You can take a backup of the system at this particular moment in time, stop the pipelines from, um, from uh, uh, stop reading from Kafka or from whatever you're using, update a new version of your code, and restart from the backup. So the backup is only keeping the, the copy of the internal state. As long as the code is compatible between one version and the other, and compatible means basically the transforms have the same internal IDs. So as long as you are keeping the same transforms, you can update to a new version of the code on a streaming pipeline without stopping the system. So there will be a small stop between, you know, the moment you stop, you keep the backup, you put a new version, and you resume, but you are not going to be losing any data. Which on streaming is super hard, and again, that's Flink working, and we support that automatically. If you pass us the new version of the jar, we are going to automatically take the backup, put the new one, and resume. So yeah, it's going to take a bit, it's going to take maybe one minute of the pipeline not outputting anything, but after one minute, it will catch up with all the old data, which is quite interesting. Yeah, you see the idea here, yeah? 
So uh, I already saw you that the, the demo with Flink, but I wanted to show you like the, the last one. I know I'm, I'm already over time, but the last one, so you can see at the beginning I told you, we want to do Cabify, we want to do Uber, we want to do something. So I have a lot of code here. I, I didn't want to scare you with all the code from the beginning. But now that I already saw you how it is a simple pipeline, I can actually show you a real life uh, pipeline a bit more interesting. And for this one, I'm using the data set of uh, the New York taxi rides, you know a data set called the taxi ride, the New York billion rides, whatever. It's basically the, the yellow cups in New York, all the data, uh, they output a CSV file per month with all the history of all the rides in New York from the taxis. So what I've been doing since before I left the hotel this morning, I connected a machine and I've been sending a few thousand events per uh, minute, you know, for the last two or three hours. So it's been like a streaming here, and I have a pipeline, which the code is very similar to the one I saw you, just a slightly more complex, but very similar, really. I want to use this window. Uh, yeah, terminate, whatever, I don't care. Okay, so the code is quite similar. How can I hide this? Cool. So basically here, what I'm doing is like, yeah, we, you know, checking the properties, blah, blah, blah. We connect to the uh, input stream, that's okay. Then we are going to be doing analytics of taxi rides in New York. I have a first filter, which is taking out every taxi ride with coordinates outside of New York, in case I have like invalid data. And then I have here just a, a very simple operation, which is I want to output in windows of one hour, I want to output the total number of trips. So it's very similar to what I saw you, just studying the, the window of one hour. In another calculation, I'm doing the average of the duration of the trips. And then, at the very end, I'm just adding this to two different indexes in Elasticsearch. No more knowledge. So the code is a bit more complex, but that's the idea. One transformation for the total, one for the average, the final output, two indexes on Elasticsearch. If I go now to Elasticsearch, I have, on Amazon we have Manage Elasticsearch. So if I go to my Elasticsearch, which should be somewhere here, and if I have the right permissions for the IP, that, that sometimes doesn't happen, we should see that I have here a Kibana dashboard Come on, you can do this, Elastic. With the hotspots, the counts of the taxi rides here. So what I'm doing is like I'm streaming the data much faster than usual, okay? And basically, if I go to the Kinesis dashboard, we can actually see on the monitoring how fast we are sending data. So here I've been sending data and so we have now about a quarter million records on the stream. Uh, so I've been, at some points I've been putting, uh, not much, just 12,000 records per minute, which is just a few hundred per second. So again, it's not really, you know, super huge scale, but I could just add more starts and add more capacity, and I will pay more, but that's about it. I, I don't have to change anything on the pipeline, just, you know, pay more money to your Bezos. And, uh, yeah, so here you have, again, the I wanted to check the latency. So latency, putting a record, it takes like about five milliseconds, and reading a record, which is what I wanted to see, what I have the latency here, so reading a record takes about 24 milliseconds latency maximum, or you know, at some times 20 milliseconds. So that's real time. That's kind of what we are doing in this pipeline. Sending data, streaming, and working with this. I know I'm already three minutes over the time. So quickly, the three last slides. Uh, this was, that's not what I wanted to present. But I know what you are thinking. But it's Java, and it's just an aggregate, an average, or something. And you've been telling me all the time that these tools can do exactly what we do with SQL, but with Java code or something. It turns out, if all you have to do is simple transformation like this, like average and count and group bytes, you can use Kinesis Analytics for SQL, in which you can build your pipeline without having to write any Java code, just writing SQL. And you can change 
as many SQL queries, and the input of one can be the output of the other. So basically, what we give you, you connect your uh, SQL streaming to the data stream. We auto detect the schema automatically. And then you write a query. Uh, let me, this one is a bit nicer. So then you create a query as like this. I want to do a count of this particular thing grouped by the IP address, but I want to do this every minute. So this is every minute it will output that calculation automatically, just with SQL. You don't have to do any Java. And it's fully serverless. You don't have to do anything. Just put this to work, and it will do the average automatically, which is quite interesting if you ask me. We actually have exceptions. Uh, sorry, we actually have some extensions, like for example, for doing anomaly detection. In this case, I'm doing based on the latest 100,000 events, tell me if you can detect any anomaly on this event. And it will tell me this event seems to be an anomaly, and it will tell me why. It will say, in this column, you usually have a value between 10 and 30, and in this particular event, you have 55. So that sounds like an anomaly. So automatically, you can do anomaly detections over a stream of data without having to write any Java code, any Python code, just uh, SQL. So that's what I had. You have some links here if you want to learn more about this. Sorry about the four minutes I, I took over the time. I don't know if you have time for any questions, but uh, if, if you do have any questions and we don't have the time now, I'm going to stick around. So just feel free to uh, ask me anything or any feedback you can provide. Sorry about the Java code, and thank you. Thank you. And let me...